the session three of the colloquium, and it's it's called a, a unfinished revolution. And every time I'll probably say, "Don't get mistaken. It's not my personal revolution. Uh, I get personally involved, but it's a revolution that that we really hope the world will take seriously about." And uh, it's it's started. So <clears throat> um, there there is sort of an issue for me year after year of uh, sort of having a set of new concepts and if you go through them at one lecture and maybe spend five or ten minutes on one of them and, and then go through on others it turns out that people don't, don't it isn't easy to fit them together when you have five or six new ones so I'll just sort of insist on making light brush ups through and try to use some different words when I go through them but at every time we'll probably hit those same basic concepts just to be sure and then, then show about weaving them in. <clears throat> so this session is going to focus heavily on what we call the Kodiak capability. And that was just an uh, acronym that evolved about seven or eight years ago to try to talk about a, a special cluster of capabilities in organizations. And we'll talk about uh, that more. But that's, that's kind of, we're going to bump back into that over and over again. And, uh, this is sort of the heart of how organizations can be collectively smarter is by concentrating better on those capabilities we lump into the Kodiak term. And uh, so anyway, the, the way this colloquium started out also is we hit hard on big global problems that the world's facing and, and telling the world that uh, the technology that's erupting is going to actually add a lot more global problems because it's going to it pervade throughout the globe in many, 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 many special activities that people employ. And as each one of those activities changes its nature, the ones that depend on interrelated with it are going to have to adapt. And they in turn might also be also being adapting because of the technology. So they have the double ones. So essentially every organization has this double thing to walk about in this rapid change. One is the changes it has to go through in order to make itself more competent by harnessing the technology in effective ways. But at the same time it's going through that, it has to change its role. Its, its role is changing in society because the rest of the institutions on which it depends are also undergoing change. So that big massive set of changes is very likely in the future to cause sudden dislocations. That all of a sudden somebody is just the connection sheared off with their way of working in the past and they hadn't adapted enough. And so one of the things we talk about is the kind of foresight everybody, every organization is going to need as it evolves. And part of the strategy is in the complex, many faceted change that's going to go on, how can the glimpse about the future be, be constructed and provided to people? And so that's part of a general strategic evolutionary environment that we're talking about has to happen. And it's an environment which, which no single entity that I know of on the earth is big enough to say we will do it because it's going to take many, many. Every nation's got to adapt in this way, but they have to do it in a way that doesn't cut them off from interchanges with other nations, with other countries and their languages, etc. So there, it's, it's a very big scale kind of evolutionary adaptation that has to go on and it's happening rapidly enough that sort of the normal cut and try organic evolution is just bound to get into trouble. So you say, all right, it's called for something, uh, you just say it's a strategy. How do organizations follow a strategy? And there have to be some explicit ways in which there's intercommunicating coordination among people to the extent that, that say, uh, well, let's look at it like this. We've We've said it's, it's a way to think about organizations is every one of them is a social organism. And uh, what's the technology that's erupting is bringing to them, among other things, a brand new, very much more efficient nervous system to interconnect and function as nervous systems do in organisms. And this is going to elicit a lot of, of associated evolution inside of the organis organisms. And uh, so we just talk about the, the in trying to get an evolutionary environment that there's no one who can say what the end state is, 
but we can look for the kind of evolution in which every organism operating in its own ecological niche has the best chance of seeing what's happening among all the other organisms that are changing so that it can make a, a judicious decision about which way its migration is going to follow. And so some will, some will go the right way and some won't, and everybody should learn by it. But if we don't have an open environment like that for the evolution, it's going to be really tough because you know, huge masses of people that are tied in with, say, one kind of product line or something end up sort of declining in their capability because the evolution wasn't open enough. It's many, many, many facets to the evolution. It <coughs> has a lot of similarity to the bioevolution. And uh, I've really enjoyed the discussions with biological evolutionary or uh, biological evolution people who study that. And uh, so that'll be part of our discussion. <coughs> But anyway, so we're interested in the global capability boosting measures in the world, that that's what we have to do is look for key capabilities and find out the better ways for boosting them. And, uh, <coughs> and then we also have to be watching the paradigms that we employ and try to help the general paradigms out in the public from, from getting locked up in cases. So this is a job where you can shake your finger at the journalists a lot of times and say, just the very way that they handle a write-up, the nouns and adjectives, et cetera, that they throw around, just sort of either go along with somebody's out-of-dated paradigm or they actually indicate to the person that there's a shift in some kind of subtle thinking that they'll think about. So anyway, this all adds up that there's really a global need for a large-scale strategy. and. Uh, this is something that not hardly any of us ever get to get interacting with is things that are strategies of any great scope. <clears throat> you know, we, w you know we, we stumble through our own lives generally and uh, once in a while we read about a, a, a general who's great at strategies and, uh, and the fights that general has with the tactical leaders who may be great at tacticians but they'll run ahead of their resources and things of that sort. So anyway, strategy is, takes a different kind of way of thinking too that I found. So anyway, this Kodiak and collective IQ are, are the kind of focus we'll try to hit on today, but we'll do it from going around the circle, sort of, and looking at it from different points of view. And part of the, of when you get into the collective IQ, the sort of thing you see is a set of capabilities that we call Kodiak. So we'll use them almost interchangeably. So uh, they, they're both capabilities, but collective IQ is in a sense a bigger one and more general than the Kodiak. And the Kodiak is sort of a first shot at how to get going on it. <clears throat> so we've seen this, this before and I, I'm sure you'll see it again. <laughs> it sort of depicts an organization and the way it interacts with the outside world and the way it has to develop its own sort of dynamic knowledge inside that organization, that it's operative knowledge. And you could say that's a model of each of you individuals too, that you're interacting with the outside world and you're ingesting things and you have to integrate them. And a lot of things come into you that you just take at surface value and it takes quite a while for that to be integrated in with other things you know and believe and disbelieve, etc., like that, so that there is sort of an operative label layer of what they'd say you have ready knowledge in top that sort of goes along with what we call a knowledge product here. And so kind of creating among all the activity going on inside the organization, dynamically keeping updated this sort of knowledge product is a very, very s significant challenge and I don't, I don't see it being done elsewhere or focused. And I, I don't say we know how to do it too, but it represents the challenge that's really there. So we call this a DKR for short, Dynamic Knowledge Repository, and we'll get more details about what goes on during that here with the day. <clears throat> so this is the derivative for Kodiak, and it's the concurrent development, integration, and application of knowledge. And uh, people often say, well, hey, what about learning? Well, I sort of bypassed learning in the terms of that application is you, you got to get it so applicable, <laughs> and uh, that just carries with it the implication that you've learned it, or the organization has learned it. And um, 
So development can mean both uh, you innovate it inside or you go find it and assimilate it and integrate it into your operating knowledge. Anyway, it's, it's both. So innovation, et cetera, is a dynamic part of making an effective organization. But this Kodiak sort of is, is kind of independent of that. It would function better if people are more innovative. And then you say, well, there's a lot of dynamics within the organization that really can stimulate and support innovation from the individuals. So we'll talk, you know, things like this we want to bring out and keep patching into the whole picture. So here's another diagram that you've seen before and you'll see again because it conveys a lot. <laughs> it's like saying uh, these little blob balls around there like that, or nodes, <laughs> represent organizations. Well then the whole collection of it represents an organization too. So this came out for me when somebody sketched out for me what a big manufacturing outfit like McDonnell Douglas, where I was embedded for years, uh, this is the way they operate. And you begin to realize all these lines crisscrossing between those nodes represents the kind of knowledge accessible funnels or conduits that have to be there. And that means whether you've got the legal staff, the marketing, the design, the manufacturing, uh, all those people. And then plus they pointed out the uh, suppliers out there. And I was kind of vague about suppliers, so then they drew me the map that I'd shown you before too that showed you that when they're building an airplane, that inside the corporation there are about 2,000 people operating on the design and manufacture. But outside there are like 6,000 organizations that are suppliers of various degrees of involvement. And some of those are involved in very close design work. And then the specifications have to be conveyed between them. So the interaction between them has to be very dynamic. And the kind of things we talk about in this place will be very effective in there. And, uh, and Boeing has become famous now for applying a lot of those things inside. And it'd be very interesting then to see how much more beyond Boeing we could already point to the fact that they're going to have. So if we carry this colloquium on for very many months, I could get some of my friends from Boeing and McDonnell Douglas to come and tell you stories too. <coughs> But, um, but the, um, the big thing to learn from here is when you realize that, that this concurrency factor here that's part of the term Kodiak, that, that it really implies that every organization, sub-organization, has to be dynamically evolving its repository, but at the same time as concurrently with the rest of them. But they're all part of the bigger one, which has to have a coherent, concurrent, development of its dynamic knowledge repository too, so that the concurrency among all of those is, is a very big challenge in both having technology, uh, common standards, etc., as well as practices and conventions about the users, etc., the people involved. So it's a challenge. So you just in no way could have people on one side doing their knowledge work by one vendor and those in another by another vendor where the terms and the conditions and the discussions and what functions do, and the content of the files are different. It just would be a, a mess, <coughs> unless you had some very fancy conversion things between them, so that you, <laughs> anyway. <coughs> so anyway, when we look at those three boxes on there, there's some of the discussion about them, and one of the obvious ones is this intelligence collection. And the other is recorded dialogue. Both of those take discussions and description about what's in between them. Anyway, the, uh, so this external was what's going on out there that affects our future? <clears throat> so how do we assimilate that? And how many of the facts and stuff do we need to have in order to have that picture? And where do you go scouting for them? Is it enough for your people to go to uh, conventions and, and uh, professional meetings? <clears throat> And when they come home, what should they do about the notes? What should you do about cataloging the proceedings that are from there? And then what's going to happen to all of these conference activities and professional societies in the way that they, they do their integration of what happens within their activity and making it available and applicable to you? So it's just, it's just inevitable that all that's going to be done in the network way. And so you say, oh, 
You know, those sources are going to have to be that way, and those associations are going to be organizations in themselves which need to function that way because their dynamic knowledge repository is something they're delivering to a lot of people. So it's just uh, every place you turn, you're going to face that, that the new ways of working with those organizations will need that you both got to have a lot in common in your DKRs. <coughs> mm -hmm. So another aspect of this, uh, you know, in this scenario development that most of us don't think much about scenarios, but it's a thing that's taken seriously by quite a few organizations, and every, every organization's got to have some kind of working scenarios of what it expects and the things it's going to bank and bet on about what's happening in the future. And those scenarios are going to get more and more expensive to maintain because that future is evolving pretty fast. And you can't have somebody do a year study and come, come out after six months of digesting it and giving you the picture. And he'll be, you know, he'll be 17 months out of date <laughs> soon with that. So anyway, and you have to figure out how do you know what's important? Who should we be listening to or who should we be watching? How will our organization's own environment be changing? So those are all just very critical things that, and so <clears throat> the, if, you know, the, the implication in the kind of improvement infrastructure we talked about with the A, Bs, and Cs, et cetera, that a lot of that is, is the C kind of activity in your organization. And we're going to be trying to make the case over and over again that that, that has to be or is much better if the, if the expense in both dollars and your staff uh, in doing that C work is shared among other people, other things within a NIC. That this would be the most efficient way in the future that's part of that. So anyway, and then we turn to this knowledge product on this side. Later on I'll be pointing to some of our publications that are online and uh, back in the 70s, etc. There's, uh, I, I worked a long time on one that's called, uh, let's see, Mis Mission and Discipline Oriented Communities. And a mission oriented community is like a project. And a discipline oriented one is like what a professional society uh, is doing. And they both have similar things and they both could do what we talked about, a communities knowledge workshop and the kind of things. And so there we were talking already about a similar set of, of knowledge repository components. So what I did about the, the product one is I likened it to a handbook. That at any given t time, if your handbook is up to date, you can go there and find roughly the way it's organized and find out the current state of something. And it would have citations referencing off to the material on which it depended, and you could backtrack on those. And then uh, there'd be a constant dialogue about different aspects of what's in the current handbook. And that dialogue eventually uh, would need to be recorded. And we talk about the backlinks in the environment so that you can find out that when an issue was raised and a lot of interaction and then resolved, that you can backtrack to that and find out the actual way in which that issue was resolved, who contributed to it, and the sort of conditions and factors that determine, or, you know, ended up making the agreement among people that they would then change something. So then a piece of the handbook gets retired as part of the uh, uh, dialogue, and that's part of the recorded dialogue too, and it's superseded with something, so you could backtrack from any passage in there and find out what its earlier versions looked like and why they were changed. So it, to me it's just uh, inevitable and totally imperative that that kind of dynamic is available to the kind of dialogue we're going to be using. So it's a far cry from the way in which our, uh, our news, news groups, etc., operate today, etc. Or it isn't enough to say, okay, we're going to have this super duper um, uh, search engine there. That'll, that'll be very nice or something, but you still you still need the tagging and the explicit conventions that provided those back trails in, in there in the relationships. So anyway, dialogue goes on between the people in your organization and also the outsiders, and uh, 
the dialogue about things in our intelligent repository, so people are talking about the content that's there, et cetera, too. Dialogue about mending our dialogue record, that in cases where it's inaccurate or something like that, somebody points that out, and they'll be part of the dialogue. And dialogue about improving the content of the handbook or the knowledge product. So those are going to be always in there. So when we talk some later on about the kind of things that the technology and the tool systems and the, the conventions or properties of the knowledge packages that we call documents today, that those things are all going to need to evolve and, and they need to evolve concurrently with the emergence of the practices that we're talking about doing here in the conventions. And that means people have to relearn how to be correspondents inside this dialogue environment, et cetera, and the conventions they follow. So anyway, there are a set of these basic concepts and terms about personal and organizational capability infrastructures, augmentation systems comprised of tool system, human system, the co-evolution frontier and improvement infrastructures. So just to get another touch, I'm going to go through those again now. And uh, So we talked about capability infrastructure, and then we find out that it actually is an infrastructure, whereas any given capability in this infrastructure generally is dependent upon some set of lower order ones, but so are many others, and many of these lower order ones are found to be a common, common basic part of the infrastructure of higher level, things like that. So this is part of the, of the disturbance that when the tool system comes through with really, really radical things, they can go through and touch some of these lower level capabilities to change them by quite a bit of how they operate. And then the higher level ones here, even if they're not touched directly by the technology, they need to start adapting to sort of take advantage of the new capabilities they have as support ones. See? So you said, um, uh, I like to look at simple things like and elevators that got invented and brought into the world. And then you looked at a whole bunch of the conventions for how uh, urban areas operate and businesses in those places operate. And we know that telegraph and telephone and the photocopier all changed it like this. And again, I just claim that what this technology is bringing forth is the biggest, the biggest transitional perturbation in the whole augmentation system of a society than anything ever history, anything in our history before. And that, that's, it's something, that's a paradigm issue, that if, if it isn't believed, then it's, uh, you know, a big difference. So I've been proceeding as though it is the biggest, and yes, I noticed the difference because I've been slightly out of step with prevailing paradigms for some decades, but it's sort of this, this hope now that we'll get people thinking about it, and maybe we can meet someplace halfway between. <laughs> But, um, so then we've talked about the tool system and the human system, and both of them must co-evolve. And in the end, they're depending upon these basic human capabilities down here that you're born with, and have to be developed by training into skills and knowledge so that you can operate within these things. You, people easily see that they have to operate upon the devices and facilities they have over here, but it's just exactly you have to do it over here. You have to know the terminology, you have to know how to operate, you have to know, you know, about meetings and conventions and a whole bunch of things. So that's a very, very complex system in there that's going to be just as much perturbed as this one over here. And since they both are interdependent, it's going to cause a lot. So we talk about the fact that it's just totally inappropriate for radical changes on this tool system side to think of it themselves as automating the things on the left side, on the human system side. Because they'll come in and they'll make enough changes there that you have to adapt and harness them, just how to learn how to harness it. So it isn't just like somebody can invent a, a better pressure cooker and that will improve something about kitchens. It's the sort of, you look at the way kitchens have changed in the last hundred years, and the refrigerator and the electric stove and the, and the osterizer and the garbage disposer and the microwave oven and, uh, and a freezer 
So these things are just totally different. The whole practice of cooking and food preparation, the food distribution has changed because of that. So this is what we have to expect. Um, are you keeping time? How much? <laughs> is your, your time now? Okay. So next, we're going to have Marcella Hoffman of SRI International is going to be give a talk on knowledge management. And he has two sort of attributes to bring here. One, that he's been working in this uh, business intelligence unit at SRI for years and focusing a great deal over the past years on knowledge management. So he brings, brings he really understands what's been happening out there. And the second one is he also sat in on one of our three-day seminars about eight years ago and ever since then has been interacting with us. And now, in fact, he's actually serving as, as this seminar's teaching assistant for helping, uh, helping the community evolve, etc. So I'll have to disengage from mine and go pick up his. There you are, Marcelo. OK, thank you, Dad. Okay, so what I will do today is give you a very, very short rundown of knowledge management in the business environment. It will be a very short 20 minute or so presentation and take it with a grain of salt. It's meant to be for business because those are our clients, but the meta mes uh, lesson from this, if you would take it, is how does this relate to uh, bootstrapping? How does this relate to the government or NGOs and so on? We'll have Peter Yim speak afterwards about an NGO and what they do, which in a sense is a type of knowledge management, but my bias will be directly related only to companies because that's the environment and where, where I work. Okay, and Okay, I have to move this to the, <coughs> sorry, presentation on the left there? No, it's the funny little one right. Okay. Right okay, thank you. So with that, the concept is nothing new. It's been around for a long time. Different authors have taken different uh, perspectives on this. Doug has presented his views. Peter Drucker has written extensively about knowledge workers. But what's, what is new now is the internet. It is the networks. It is the greater computing power and the like. We can say that the status is pretty much equivalent to uh, the quality movement some 20, 30 years ago when it, you speak about knowledge management in the corporate settings. Everybody speaks about knowledge management af as if it were something consistent, unique, individualizable, etc. It is not. And I will give some uh, descriptions of what different folks mean by knowledge management and then talk about some uh, cases, some suggestions for implementation, and then what we see in the future. And then perhaps if you keep in your mind, how does this relate to Doug's ideas, theories, strategies, and the like. One thing I would like to emphasize that this knowledge management stuff is not a fad. It's definitely something that will remain for a while but it will evolve. Um, the popularity has been only in the last five years. It probably might change in terms of uh, methodology, syntax, semantics, and the like, but it's not going to go away as some of the other uh, uh, business consulting fads have come and gone. Um, and perhaps something to keep in mind also is what methodologies are applicable to be transferred from the milieu of uh, knowledge management to bootstrapping. I believe some will, some will not, but perhaps it's something that we should look at collectively. For lack of a definition, there are many descriptions, but one thing that is very consistent is something about value, either creating value or reusing value or conversion into or out of value, reuse of knowledge and the like. Um, it's a result of many evolutionary processes and trends but definitely it's mostly about management. When you really get down to it, if you cannot manage a corporation, you're not going to be able to do knowledge management particularly well. And I'll get into that in greater detail later on. The practices vary, and this I would like to emphasize. Different writers, different authors and consultants speak as if knowledge management were any one of these four components and sometimes a mix, a combination, hybrids, and the like. 
but all of these are included by some anyway. Valuing knowledge has been around for a while, getting increasing uh, importance in terms of recognition and valuation. Evaluation is very problematic. There are some attempts to go beyond accounting, but it's a matter of judgment. There are no ways to measure val and value knowledge in a unique, uh, repeatable way. But there are some ways in which you can compare greater or lesser value. Exploiting intellectual property, that's something that's very much in vogue. Um, particularly by large companies that have been able to reduce the cost of maintaining intellectual property, uh, selling what they have that they're not using. Companies like Dow, Motorola, there are a number of cases where they have used this very uh, effectively both to reduce their cost and increase their profitability. Managing knowledge workers, that's been around forever, um, perhaps since the uh, uh, Middle Ages but obviously it's getting more and more important now and I will emphasize this later on in my presentation that the, if there is a meta message behind this knowledge management uh, fad or movement is that what is being used rather effectively is what's considered explicit knowledge stuff that falls into databases, knowledge bases, manuals, you know, all this stuff that's very obviously valuable and useful and repeatable and reusable and so on. What isn't well used or not as well used is what's tacit, implicit in people's heads, that sort of thing. We haven't quite learned how to reuse what's in people's heads, but I'll give some suggestions of uh, technologies that might help reduce the problem of reusing uh, implicit knowledge. The last one is the one that perhaps has the most potential, the greatest value, and arguably the most difficult to uh, capture. This whole issue of capturing, and I'll read it directly, sharing distribution of work-based learning from the day-to-day -day work of uh, knowledge uh, workers. And this implies from within the firm, outside, competitors, uh, suppliers, allies, and the like. This is very problematic, and for this you would need to have something like what Doug calls a dynamic knowledge repository. What we have seen in the companies that we have studied is that this is not done particularly well. It's done very ad hoc. Some companies are better than others, but um, perhaps by chance or by cultural reasons, or there is no great methodology that can be uh, transferred. And the practices of the four components that you see above here do overlap and in times um, keep expanding. Now when looking at the approaches, the formal approaches used by companies who are very heavily involved with knowledge management evolve. The first movement, if you would, of uh, keeping track of repositories has been pretty much done by most large companies. It's fairly straightforward it's not that difficult to do. And you see all the, the different uh, kinds of collections of uh, knowledge and information or data, if you would. Um, but the latter component, which we think is very important, is relatively new. The whole thing about search engines, data mining, visualization, making stuff available more easily, making it accessible when people need it, ideally as they need it. That's a little bit of a stretch as of now, but perhaps in time. Technology solutions are coming. The second set of activities, the second set of approaches is this whole arena of uh, networks. And that's for the purpose of creating, holding, transferring tacit or implicit knowledge. This is much more, much more problematic. It's really about managing people, designing organizations, evolving organizations and the people who are within them. Um, Different companies use different approaches. The classic uh, ways are connecting people, um, teams, uh, ad hoc, get-togethers, uh, some of the better companies locally. You can see that they design their offices and their buildings to um, increase the likelihood that people will meet with others. Several folks here who have worked for Sun um, will smile when uh, I mention that at Sun, say in the new um, Sun facility in Menlo Park, there are like mini cafeterias every so often as a way to have folks gather there, um, exchange information, knowledge, and surprise, surprise, there are whiteboards right across there. 
well, it's to get this exchange that cannot be done in other more formal ways. And the last point about communities of learning and practice is something that's been going on now for a while, but increasingly there's more attention to this, and I think um, as the technology to connect and the networks become increasingly more powerful, this will become even more popular. However, face-to-face -face will not go away anytime soon. If there's a question about this, perhaps there might be competition with very high definition screens and so on. If you can get the, the dynamics that are better than being there, but I'm not sure that that will be the case. Not yet, not for a while anyway. If we look at the enablers and resources that are used for knowledge management, you can go from the left side, going from noise data information. I spoke about knowledge as object, then going on to knowledge as process. The latter, the, the higher right hand corner will be knowledge as emergent properties. And this is really tricky to go to. Um, that's something that I believe is still a research question, perhaps by using bootstrapping and evolving organizations beyond the current state, this will work out. But there is no, no methodology or approach that I know of from all the companies I've interviewed and visited with and spoken to. But in a sense, there is this transition from the low end stuff to the higher end, increasingly more tacit, more complex, and much more difficult to transfer. The emphases by various companies vary dramatically. If you look here from the left side, the more mechanistic approaches to the organic. If there's one message that we can convey is that in general, most modern companies are going from the left side to the right side, but not all evenly and not evenly down this uh, list of um, uh, characteristics. You know, one company might be very interested in short-term tactical ideas, but very involved with creativity and innovation, and so on. So you would see somewhat of a zigzag of organizations if you were to take some sort of measurement across a large number. But in general, we have seen a transition from the left side to the right side towards some more biological uh, approaches. And also larger scale and more chaotic, perhaps um, going along with the Santa Fe Institute talks about uh, chaos and chaos theory. Another way of looking at this knowledge management and the processes underneath is that they tend to go from the simple tangible onto the less and less tangible, but potentially the greater the benefit. And when I've given these presentations in different, uh, different companies and different countries, what tends to um, come back from the dialogue is most companies are the, at the left-hand corner, bottom left-hand corner trying to avoid repeating the, the invention of the wheel. And they keep doing that uh, over time more efficiently. Uh, some are going to the, the concept of how do they make a better wheel, but not that many and not often on purpose. If this were drawn to scale, there would be a major chasm between that and the fellow on the hand glider because that's changing paradigms. That's very difficult. Um, and going from there to thinking about thinking, the meta approaches that Doug uh, proposes. I have yet to see any organization, any other speaker besides Doug and the group that's uh, promoting uh, and trying to bring this bootstrapping to happen, uh, suggesting this. So if there were a chart describing where the companies are that we have observed, it would be largely at the bottom left with a few going up and then nobody at the top right hand side. And there might be some hypotheses about countries and the size of organization and so on. Um, going back to, say, um, some visits in Japan some time back, Japanese companies, for example, are very good at not reinventing the wheel. Um, they transfer that kind of knowledge r relatively well. They have a very hard time with creativity and innovation and so on. Different cultures will work differently, better for some things, less well for others. Um, Organizational models is something that's very important to look at when considering knowledge management. Um, the three kinds of organizations, for lack of uh, a better taxonomy that we have seen, command and control, exchange economy, and give society. What's very common is that many speakers present the idea of a gift society as if that were the one that they will get to first. I have yet to see that happen, if anything you can get into an exchange economy where there's a trade-off. 
I will give you something if you will give me something in return that's equally valuable or better. Um, and one of the suggestions we make is to go for that, to go for the exchange economy. Don't assume that you will generate a gift society or a gift group just by itself. You have to develop the trust, go from the command and control to the exchange economy and then to a gift society. And in fact, most organizations will probably oscillate between an exchange economy environment and a gift society environment, you know, depending if the trust goes up and down. But it's still better than working in a command and control where folks will only contribute what they have to contribute and no more. So this is something to consider if one were to analyze what is the situation in a particular company. And we suggest to also consider how to uh, foment the evolution from an exchange economy to a gift society. <coughs> what we have found among the cases that we have analyzed in greater detail is that they're extremely contextual to be successful. There's no um, generic approach that will work in different companies. Two cases that I have found that are classics, Chaparral Steel, a small mini mill, some couple thousand people, where and Boeing, the 777, I couldn't think of Boeing as a company because it's just too large. But if you can uh, compare Chaparral Steel, they work essentially as if they were a um, middle age, I, I mean, a, a company working in the middle ages with apprenticeships. And they have their R&D on the production floor. So folks learn, newer folks learn from folks who have been there longer and have done steel making longer and, that's, and so on. Very tacit knowledge, very little use of computers. Uh, once they sell the steel, it's gone. They don't have to guarantee it anymore. If you contrast that to Boeing, when they have to keep track of everything they've done for years and years, maybe for the 40 or 50 years that the, the airplane will fly, it's a very different environment. It's a different approach and for good reasons. So if I were to take another metaphor, it's sort of right brain, left brain. But the whole concept here is to be specific. What kind of organization do you have? What do you want to get out of it? And then uh, what do you design for? And perhaps what kinds of folks do you hire, train, uh, support, that sort of thing. One of the suggestions we have found is very useful is go for the early benefits. There's nothing better to build up the bandwagon effect than be successful early on. And what we have found within that is <clears throat> the idea of going after the improved knowledge repositories. It's much easier to prove the benefit of these than to prove the benefit of a network that might take six months, a year, two years to, to come up with something interesting and exciting. Also going for effectiveness and efficiency. And even though these might be lower level gains, they're still useful to create the environment that in a sense will take you to the higher level. But one thing is to keep in mind, you cannot uh, predict what will happen in the longer run. Literally, users build the road as they travel it. And it's a co-discovery between the developers, designers, participants, and the like. It's an interesting travel uh, with all kinds of uh, detours. Some of the risks that we have found in organizations that try to do this fairly fast, the shifts in power, the, the changes in, in politics and relationships and so on, were very problematic and oftentimes uh, senior management was not aware of what the effects would be until after the fact, until it was a major crash. And the problem of uh, implementing these things is also difficult enough that we suggest start small, evolve, grow, see what works in your organization, and then um, as long as there are successes, things will evolve ni nicely. And otherwise, if you try to do something too big, there will be major problems in allocating costs because those who pay are not necessarily those who benefit, and then there will be a major uh, fight for who pays, who gains, where, when, and these things uh, spread over time, which is very problematic because there's still, as I mentioned earlier, not very good ways to measure what the value of improved knowledge management will be over time. We have found that there are at least two kinds of resources that are absolutely crucial. The organizational part, in uh, Doug's terminology, it would be the human systems, the agreements, the excitement, the, the promotion of uh, the right kinds of activities, of uh, behaviors, that sort of thing. We would add mentoring, training, support to the point of being pedantic. Definitely leadership from senior executives is very important. Besides that, infrastructure. 
I'll go back to what I mentioned earlier. Even the architecture of the buildings where collaborators work is important for folks to meet in an environment that's conducive for them to do what they want to do better. Obviously, computers, networks, all that, they're nice, nothing new there, but um, important to have ongoing mentoring, training, and support. We've had um, cases of that even at SRI where, as Microsoft keeps changing the software, uh, we need support where we didn't think we would need support. So I've had several cases of that myself. Several things that we see as enablers now that <coughs> I also mentioned earlier about the, the networks, the tools, the internet. Um, a lot of value will be gained from the transition from HTML to XML, perhaps KQML, Java, others. I think we'll have some speakers later next week and the following week getting into this into much greater detail. Um, uh, so I will not dwell into this one. Search technology is going to be very important because soon there will be the ability to capture, as Jim Spohr said last week, um, you know, if you can have a very small form factor hard drive that can store all the audio for your whole life, well, that's nice, but then how do you find anything? So if we have better search techniques and approaches, particularly things from artificial intelligence, speech recognition, natural language, knowledge bases, and so on, in a somewhat automated fashion, they'll be quite nice and useful. Um, these things are here now. They can be used better, but um, they're there. Okay, one thing that's coming up that's not quite there yet, the idea of cross-referencing multimedia. Actually, SRI has some efforts on this where you can cross-correlate um, different media streams from video, sound, uh, documents, and so on. And if you can do what amounts to multimedia search, there's a great potential there, both for good and for um, spying and for privacy violations and for security problems. But still, it's something worth looking at because it's got uh, very good potential. Um, this whole idea of automating some of the, the activities that people do now also has a huge potential, although it will never, or not for a long time, become completely automated. I don't think people will be pulled out of the loop but perhaps the lower level activities, the lower level tasks can be automated. And I believe Doug goes along with that uh, in terms of uh, coevolution and so on. The suggestions that we have made that seem to be consistent with most of the, the success, uh, ca successive, uh, su success cases that we've seen, or cases of success, uh, follow here. The idea is to start looking at what are the needs take a very good look at the human organizational elements, factors, um, environment, culture, all that. Then start the design process with the knowledge architecture. What should be the ideal combination of things so that users would get benefit fairly early on? Only then think of the, the technology infrastructure and then stop, start doing this in modular fashion, test, improve, and repeat the steps. This is a highly iterative process. I have yet to see any successful company deploy a, knowledge man a formal large knowledge management system in one fell swoop. It, it just doesn't happen. It's too complicated. Um, some of the possibilities ahead improve the processes in a much more global fashion. Large scale implementations, what Doug talks about, you know, meta meta levels, large organizations collaborating in a closely coupled fashion, um, maybe across uh, uh, <coughs> countries or uh, large, large enterprises. Another great opportunity is the one to enhance individual and group creativity. That's something that we don't have much of a handle yet, but perhaps by reducing the lower level functions, um, then folks will have the, the, the time and ability to do higher level activities. And then this whole uh, notion of the seamless web of resources, combining them in a fashion that's useful at the time that's needed in the best way. Um, that's a little bit of a pie in the sky for now, but perhaps not in a few years. It's something that we will have to evolve into. And I wanted to finish with some comments on uh, some, uh, a slide presented by Jim Spohr last week about learning that although when it comes to knowledge management, um, it has taken to some extent the first three of these um, 
components, performance support, practice skills, and habits, and training. It has yet to, within the corporate setting, look at education, research, the finding of new answers, and finding the new questions. That's still a lot of uh, opportunity there, but I'm not sure that we quite have it uh, yet. And with that, I finish my presentation and uh, cede the floor back to Doug. So thank you. Find me out of there. <laughs> Remember, <clears throat> remember what I was saying? <laughs> I got caught up in what Marcella was saying. <clears throat> and it's, it's a really good example. <clears throat> we could almost go through slide by slide, point by point, and just say, well, if you've got a strategy that you think is going to be effective, how does it accommodate the different, you know, he describes states of things, what's happening to people out there, it's their real life experiences and the real life edging and moving, real life things about, hey, I'm going to protect my knowledge because that's a big part of my value, so I'll only put out what's necessary to make the next set of points I need to make with something. <clears throat> so those are cultural changes and uh, practice of changes inside organizations. So the two things we need to think about in that respect. One of them is, you know, how much better could we get and the other is how many things like we're talking about would need to change. So then you say, okay, is there an evolutionary environment which would bring that about? And uh, so all I can just say is in that search for that environment, those organizations of every size that are more successful in finding an evolutionary environment that works are going to move on ahead. And that's going to be a, a thing in itself. That some of them won't. They'll fall back and they'll die or whatever it is. And there'd be a lot of bloodshed, or at least resource shed, et cetera, and sadness. So one of the other things that come out in, in our strategy here is saying, <clears throat> hey, what kind of visibility does each organization need about what's happening out there in order to be as smart as possible about deciding what's there? See, some of the, some of the people that are making decisions about what to invest in that uh, aren't, just aren't oriented about that future. They're oriented to be very pragmatic uh, tactical executives at the time like that. And then the ones that are running for-profit organizations have a very definite s handicap these days is the stock market, especially with day trading coming on. That every little wiggle that they ha they'll have people through the board to send upon them if it's a wiggle in the wrong direction. And those wiggles, you know, uh, would just kill you if you have to spend all your time. You can't get resources approved for longer-term improvements because what you have to do is invest in the bottom line at least by the next quarter. And so for the scale of things that are happening and the degree of change, it's sort of uh, a kind of a madness. And historians in 50 years or some time <laughs> in there, you see in 30 years there'll be such smart historians that they can assess things much more quickly and effectively, I guess, right? <clears throat> but I, I just wanted to bet that, that we'll look Today will look like the dark ages, you know, the, of the sort of primitive ways in which we operated, the sort of uh, ways in which a, a local tyrant could build a castle and, and be a lord for a while and fight it out with the other lords, etc. That there'd be a lot of a lot of things about it. And sometimes I get pictures of the big cities from, uh, say, 150 years ago or 300 years ago, where. You know, the sewage wasn't there, uh, it was noisy, uh, the police weren't very effective, you, <laughs> all kinds of things. One of the things, you're afraid to walk in the street. And one of the reasons why you'd walk uh, the woman on the inside, the man on the outside, is because they dumped the things out of the window a little bit, and the one closer to the house was a little bit safer from uh, the, the falling stuff. Is that right? Less safe. Less safe. Oh, that's the way the to treat women. They were dandies, and they didn't want their clothes damaged <laughs> by the chamber pots. So, let's just translate that into some picture from 
20, 20 years from now, historians looking at what we do today, and what, what, will, look, what will look barbaric about today. That's very interesting. Anyway, <clears throat> the, the issues of being idealistic about a strategy that may help us evolve, uh, it's, I, it, it's easy to look at a lot of the pragmatic things that are happening today and, and discard it, say, oh, you've got to face reality. But what some of the realities are the rate and complexity of the change that are happening and reality that our old methods of coping with change aren't at all adequate for this new rate or especially for you know three years from now or something of that sort so that we we really have to start looking for a strategy so don't knock a strategy until you've got something that's a better strategy see? and it needs to take account of quite a few different things so I would welcome the dialogue uh, but anyway this basic coevolution is very important and also we look at the concept of the augmentation system the down here in the middle bottom, this basic human capabilities is all we've got. <laughs> and the only thing we can do to boost our effectiveness and coping with the world, etc., is what we build up in the tool system, the hum human system, and the capability infrastructure we have there. And along with that goes ethics and many other sort of cultural aspects of something that are very, very important. In that. But anyway, that's all we have, that augmentation system. And so it's going to have tremors like an earthquake coming about. And so we need to have a, a way to look and think about the evolution of that as it goes. So we talked also about saying if you've got human system and tool system and they've both been changing through the years, we went through this picture of saying we could probably go and put many of the societies of Earth, locate them someplace in this rectangle. So this is a very, very, very simplified picture because both the tool system and the human system are multi-dimensions, so it's a really a complex space out there. But it's a space in which the traversal has been out in this direction. And then we say, okay, that's sort of the, the environment that most of our organizations, the evolution of it in, in this environment was what now guides the way we evolve. But, you know, this is more like it we're approaching. And a uh, little, little later, Neil, Jacobstein will talk about the, uh, uh, the sort of nanotechnology aspects, which are just a clear sort of example of what's propelling this out there. So that's a much bigger, much more complex frontier out there. So what's going to guide your evolution? And how much resource are you going to have to spend in scouting it out and then picking a path and moving? Because if you don't, if you move at the old rates, you know, you'll just be out here an inch or so when the real action is out in here in the world. So who's going to change? So this is everybody, individuals, every sized organization, every city, county, state, every country, and the nation as a whole, and they're like that, have to adapt to that kind of change. So that's, that's just big. So if that doesn't warrant a strategy or demand one, I don't know what will. So this and another appreciation was the improvement infrastructure, that part of your capability infrastructure is that sub-infrastructure which does the changes that bring about the improvement in the capability of the major one. So it, I, it's just up in here so you can see it. <laughs> it's generally submerged and sometimes they're very far down and not very strong. But the thing is that, that, that these, the improvement infrastructure is based upon a lot of the same infrastructure components that the major capability infrastructure is. And so you say, if I end up by making that better, I'm going to also change a lot of things that will do the capability infrastructure for the whole organization quite a bit of good. And so this is one of the benefits we look at. It says, hey, if we early concentrate on the capabilities which boost the improvement capability, then this is going to be a strategic thing to consider. So that's, that's what we've done, and that's, that's what we call the bootstrapping. So this, the reminder about this whole infrastructure that we had the A, B, and C activities, and that a C community is an improvement community, and a network improvement community was an improvement community continuously improving its community support Kodiak capability, and a meta-NIC, it's a NIC serving a cooperative community of NICs towards their continuous improvement 
as being nicks. So those are all, they're not very complicated, but through the last 15 years, they just emerged as something that fits together in my mind. But we need the dialogue to get there. So here we are, A, B, and C. A is a core business activity. B is the activity that improves A. C is the activity that improves B, etc. And we could group people, group organizations together that have common improvement vectors or plans in mind so that they can share the C work. So this is exactly what a professional society does in which your corporation will send you out to participate in and spend resources at that. It's to help them sort of keep an eye on what's the future is going on and you're supposed to bring it back and integrate it. But then as that future is getting so much more complicated, we've got to be more effective about it. And one of the things is the hypothesis is that cooperating on that investment will be a real payoff. And then there are other cultural things about different of these organizations say, well, why? If we keep it secret, we're better off. Well, anyway, it's just something to learn. But pretty soon, the other people, other organizations in the next should kick you out if you're going to fall short about participating to your extent. <coughs> and then we say that the next, the next thing to do is make this with a dynamic knowledge repository and have the most advanced sort of, of knowledge capability support that you can in order for the operation of this as a NIC, as a improvement community. So we call them NICs. And then another step of that is to say, oh, then what if we find a bunch of good nicks, good nicks, <laughs> and say, hey, would you like to join under an umbrella of a meta nick? So the function of this nick here is to be helping with the associated things that these different nicks need to know in order to make choices of how they evolve to be better nicks. So from time to time, we're going to be trying to elicit, like, uh, you know, there's education next that we lined up with talking and several kinds of things like that. Uh, professional society NICS, uh, especially the computer society, etc. And uh, there are a lot of candidates out there. So a question is saying, whom can you go and elicit or solicit to say they're going to start investing in becoming a NIC and joining this kind of an organization? Well, in the first place, you have to find ways that are just similar to what Marcella was talking about is how do you make a business case for these people to spend different, spend their budget more money and differently from before. A professional society, for instance, makes a fair amount of its money apparently from selling its, its hard copy uh, proceedings. So if they're going to go online like this, they'll have everything online. So he says, oh, what happens there? Well, the same way in book publishing and science today, they're all starting to look at the net, Nick, net, <laughs> for as a publication medium, and they have to find a way to solve it. So there's a complication, but it's something that just needs to be done, because it's absolutely inevitable that, that that's the way things are going to be done, and it's online. So get there quickly, and there'll be much smaller packages of what you deliver often than a whole book or a whole article. You make a contribution, it can be something short, take you 20 minutes maybe to put an idea in and get it integrated. So the, the challenge for an environment like that to be a lot more dynamic is going to put uh, many of these organizations in a real problem. So here is Marcello's thing. And I'm, I'm going more slowly. <laughs> so anyway, so the, uh, this bootstrap approach to large-scale capability improvement, so it involves strategic choices in the type of improvement community that's favored in early recruitment of NICs by MetaNIC. So that is, all the candidate improvement communities aren't alike in that sense. That some of them, by being members and investing some of the resources and trying to coordinate them within a MetaNIC, would turn out the very product of what they're building and doing as a NIC is something that all their other NICs could benefit from. And that just that single kind of criteria uh, would be a very important sort of thing. So you say, which order would I get them in? And the idea of starting out with a metanic is a very important one too, even though it's kind of primitive, is, hey, what I'm collecting in knowledge, etc., is that which any nick could use. And I'm doing it for the benefit of maybe one nick, but I want to be careful that I can start being able to share that with others that come in and survive it. So, so anyway, so 
the, the, the which capabilities to focus on early development of high performance teams, high performance augmentation, augmented teams. So I keep talking about this and we'll try to get to it later in more detail, but that's a very, very important part of how you're going to get the evolution going is you have to get some mutations out there that aren't handicapped by the evolutionary struggle for a big organization to become something new and different. So you have to get a bunch of new and different things out there that can be looked at as real lessons, which is different from somebody put together something and did a little bit of experimenting that's not on real time, not, not a real organization. And so, um, and then those early, early applications about early efforts in making a Metanic, what do they, what, which efforts would pay off the most, just like early investments in high performance teams, which one would. So a high performance team is just something that definitely needs in the future. So what we're going to do now is shift to, uh, we have time for both, that uh, we had a, a short film on two weeks ago by Jerry Glenn, who's the one that promoted and got going on this um, Millennium <coughs> um, Challenges. So Peter Yim has, has been working with them for some years, and he's also now working with us intensely enough that he's the uh, hugely valuable manager for getting this colloquium up and off the ground. So he's going to now shepherd us through a film and some discussions he has about the participation in that program that represented a, uh, <coughs> you want to get going? Where's your the video. The video. The video. Can you run the video now, please? How can we improve our ability to think about the future? We know thinking ahead is the right thing to do. We know not thinking ahead is not a smart thing to do. But we're now no longer isolated little entities in a village somewhere. We're now part of very complex global systems so that we as a human species have to learn together how to think better into the future. One of the ways the Millennium Project has approached this methodologically um, is by identifying leading thinkers across the board, be they right wing, left wing, up wing, down wing, doesn't matter as long as they're a cross-section of the thinking in the public. We're not doing general opinion polling. We're not interested in the bell middle of the bell curve. We're interested in advanced thinking across the board. We send out questionnaires, and they're translated through nodes. We have 11 nodes around the world, from Tahran to Beijing to Tokyo, Buenos Aires, and various places around the world. They identify the leaders in those areas of thinkers and translate questionnaires to them and ask them, what are the developments that, in your judgment, are the most important things that we ought to pay attention to that could change the nature of the future, be it positive or negative. We rate these in terms of who should take the leadership, uh, what actions should be taken on these, and then we bring these with back to the nodes around the world and they identify policymakers who have the responsibility to address these, these developments and ask them for their judgments. These become one-on-one -on -one interviews. They're almost like personal briefings. This is what the rest of the world thinks, Mr. or Miss Decision Maker, about areas that you're concerned with. This is what they think ought to be done. What do you think about that? So it becomes both a collection device on judgments from around the world from policymakers, but also it becomes a briefing for them. So it's a two-way process. All of this then gets put together into our annual State of the Future reports, given back to all the participants, be they futurist scholars or policymakers, so they can see how their thought related to everybody else's. We also use this information into organized forms of scenarios. Here's how it can go with these dynamics from what people have said. Here's how it could go if things work well. So we do normative scenarios as well as exploratory scenarios. And we, through our nodes around the world, we keep track of change in various forms and make that available on our website, uh, www.acunu.org. And it has a, even a section on information we're collecting in terms of the main domains of civilization from economics to technology to governance, uh, environment, and so forth. And then what are the issues? What are the opportunities? What are the developments? What are the various actions? What are the scenarios? And we have a whole category uh, going across these. So this is, becomes almost like a, a sort of a periodic table of what's important to understand about the future and global change. So we basically collect this information, analyze it, feed it back, analyze the feedback, and make it publicly available on an ongoing basis. And this is our methodology 
We're trying to improve how we think about the future. A unique part of the methodology of the Millennium Project in dealing with all of this complexity is the decentralization of our system into nodes. Nodes uh, we've defined as groups of individuals and institutions that do the work of the project in that given region. When they do interviews, they're doing it within that regional cultural format. Uh, they uh, self-organize themselves and how they work slightly differently. In the South Pacific, because it's a pretty large area, they have telephone calls uh, once every month or two for coordinating their activities. Uh, in uh, other parts of the world, they're clustered into like one city like Buenos Aires or Tokyo, so it's, they're a closer knit group. I bring this up because it's been very popular to talk about chaos theory of the idea of attractors and the self-organizing uh, nodes and new groups. To some degree, we're doing an experiment here. Instead of the normal hierarchical system, uh, we have these nodes that uh, have emerged through the original three-year feasibility study, by the way, uh, of people who wanted to do more for the project than simply answer questionnaires. Uh, they have created their own nature, they're creating their own relationships to some degree, and uh, take on some of their own future studies where they are. So this is, in a sense, the idea of self-organization of humanware around the world. Um, it remains to be seen how well this works. Ideally, we have like the, each of these things self-funded and self-organized, but right now they're, 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 they're funded through an overall mechanism of the Millennium Project, which is under the American Council for the United Nations University. The other part of the methods that I'd like to stress is that we have a, written a, a book, essentially a 500-page book that's now on CD-ROM for easier access, that has 18 chapters on methods, futures methods, thinking about the future. I mentioned two of them previously. One was scenarios, and the other was the questionnaires and Delphi's. Uh, and also environmental scanning. But there are, uh, in our book, 16 categories of futures methods. Everything from systems modeling to cross-impact analysis, uh, futures wheels, and other methodologies. It has an introduction, giving an overview of futures thinking methods, and then a concluding chapter of where we think methodology may be going in the future and the integration of methods. Each chapter explains what a method is, how it's used, where it came from, how it can be used in combination with other methods, and speculation about that, the method, the, the future of that method. Half of the sections are written by either people who invented the method or are historically significant in the evolution of that method. Uh, we now will be sending this out to people who will be critiquing it, reviewing it, and we want to upgrade and improve that methodology. So there'll be a version 2.0 or so eventually soon. Um, so this, in addition to the overall money and project of the humanware interactivity and thinking together about the future, we'll also want to do that same interactive process of making the methodologies improved as well. This is our approach so far and how we think we can improve the capacity of humans to think better about the future in terms of being able to shape it and uh, to anticipate it and to act accordingly to improve the human condition. In this, as Doug mentioned, uh, I, in, I would, I'm in a fairly unique position because I've spent the last three years or so with the Millennium Project and uh, and also I've spent uh, over a year with Doug in person now. Uh, with Doug, uh, it goes way back. I remember towards the end of 19, the 1980s. Towards the end of 1980s, uh, I was working on my own company. Uh, I ran a manufacturing operation uh, with a fairly strategic outlook. 
and I was going into computer integrated manufacturing and soon enough I found that uh, we were dealing with a lot of transaction processes that needs automation that could be integrated but did not cover a lot of the aspects that human interaction uh, are engaging in. And there I had the chance to read about Doug and uh, I, belie I believe the first book that I came across was uh, Irene Grives' uh, CSCW uh, book for, uh, of readings and the first paper there was uh, Vannevar Bush as we uh, as we, we were thinking yeah. and the next four papers were Doug Engelbart's and I believe the first one that came after that was uh, Doug's sort of maybe a predecessor or a variant of his seminal uh, October 1962 Air Force report on augmenting the human intellect. Uh, I was awed and, and I said, I mean, one of these days I will want to meet with this person and through a lot of coincidence, I mean, I got to communicate with Doug. I mean, I can tell you later a uh, different setting. But, uh, and through through last year, working closely with him, I mean, I come to realize and more and more what he was trying to do, and I was suggesting that the Millennium Project may be a good case that we could sort of uh, see how one group has been doing things that are fairly similar. And at this, at the end of this presentation, maybe I'll try to pull some parallels and and provide some of my personal observations. Uh, just sort of a point of order, a few people came up to me and, and asked what were the 15 challenges. I mean, I just put a slide on it, you can't read it here anyway. Uh, other people asked me, I mean, what were the, their uh, uh, web, uh, website URL? Uh, there are two, I mean, actually they, they, they are aliases. I mean, it's either millennium-project.org or ac-unu.org slash millennium. And the Millennium Project's purpose, as, start, as stated in the 1992 feasibility study, is to assist organ, organizing future research, update and improve global thinking about the future, and making that thinking available for consideration in public policy making, advanced training, public education, and feedback to create cumulative wisdom about potential futures. Uh, and I believe it's a wonderful example how this one group has been harnessing the collective intelligence of hundreds of individuals to achieve that purpose. Uh, how should we characterize it? I believe the Millennium Project is the first example of the globalization of futures research. Futures research is actually fairly new, even in the United States. And, and to extend it across the world, I mean, from places like Africa to Eastern Europe to Latin America to Asia, uh, this is fairly unique. Interinstitutional, multidisciplinary, an international participatory think tank of about 550 futurists, scholars, and policymakers in 50 countries, and as Jerry was saying, organized in a distributed network of more than 11 nodes. I mean, why? I mean, he said 11, but I, I added one more. He didn't count the United States. Uh, and like the bootstrap community, it provides a new forum in a new environment for discourse on issues which did not seem to fall within anybody's day job. Uh, when, when you really think about it, I mean, you, you would think that's the policy maker's day job or corporate le leadership, but uh, the way our paradigm, the way uh, we are structured, our corporations, our, our law making, the entire system, I mean, it's actually nobody's day job. I mean, I'll come back to this point actually later if we have time. So if we look at them towards what they're doing, 
then let's ask the first question, or what are they trying to improve? Or in Duck's terminology, what is their improvement vector? Uh, and we could say that they're sort of trying to improve global futures thinking. And do they have a sort of A work, B work, and C work? I mean, I'm going back to ev almost everything Jerry was saying in, in the video just now. Uh, in the A work, they execute their research agenda, for example, like identifying global issues, opportunities, challenges, plausible scenarios uh, to the year to 2025, etc. cetera. And, and this is planned on a yearly basis. What's the B work then? They organize themselves effective, uh, try to organize themselves effectively to cope with their work, and they collect and apply future study methodologies. I mean, that's how they're trying to improve uh, executing that research agenda. Do they do any C work? Uh, I would guess they do, because they study how they could better organize, and they are trying to improve, as Jerry was saying, I mean, getting a, the next iteration on the futures methodology, on improving the futures study methodologies. Are they a NIC? Well, they network. I mean, they, they do it via meetings, t telephone, snail mail, courier. Uh, they have a listserv and a website. Yes, I would think they are, they are a NIC. I mean, in 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 terms of, I mean, they are a group of networked global outlook panelists and researchers and policy makers. And even at times, they are a nick of nicks because, I mean, Jerry was mentioning that certain nodes have their own network environment, doing the, have their own research agenda besides just trying to execute the Millennium Project uh, research plans. Uh, what's the knowledge process and knowledge product? Well, one thing is they, they have a feedback loop. They try to leverage through feedback of findings to the panelists and policy makers. Uh, their products include like an annual state of the future report. Uh, they have this, what they call the futures matrix, and uh, they have futures methodology uh, book. This is sort of a picture of the website where they show uh, their information, the futures matrix. I mean, it's kind of difficult to see. On the left, we've got things like uh, development, questions, issues, opportunities, challenges, actions, scenarios. And on the top, uh, across, we've got like demographics and human resources environmental changes and biodiversity, technological capacity, governance and conflicts, international economics and wealth, and integration of, or whole futures. I mean, this is one way they're presenting a fairly dynamic view uh, of the information or the knowledge that they're gathering. And if every one of those sort of blue dots are clickable, and if you click into it, I mean, for example, if you do technological capacity against uh, challenges. I mean, you see, I mean, all the challenges and, the, and, and some possible sort of uh, answers in terms of a sort of technology answer that they have. So are they bootstrapping? This, I guess, we'll have to ask Doug. But I mean, they are actually doing things that I would say would be highly synergistic. And that's why I mean, sometime during the middle of the year, I had the sort of honor to put Doug in, in touch with Jerry. And uh, sometime in November last year, we s sort of came to an agreement that we'll try to collaborate. And that's why uh, Jerry is showing up on video. He's actually going to be here next week. Uh, he couldn't be here this week because he's in Japan. Uh, and then we're going to have some fairly serious meeting about uh, ongoing uh, collaboration. And uh, where are the, the sort of uh, possibilities for collaboration, like co-evolution of tool systems as well as human systems? I mean, they can definitely use a boost in, technolo uh, in technology, uh, which is one area that some of our bootstrappers are highly enthusiastic about. Uh, their content rich, rich 
and has already focused challenges into major domains for us. And the bootstrap community can actually isolate specific areas uh, to delve into as test cases for bootstrapping. Uh, they would offer tremendous opportunity for contribution to MetaNix because a lot of their methodologies would be helpful, I mean, across the board for Nix. And more pragmatically, uh, jointly, maybe we could tap into funding support that possibly neither of us alone could access. So uh, through this time, maybe, I mean, now that I still have a couple of minutes, uh, maybe I'll, I'll sort of express some personal observation on the paradigm shift that Doug is calling us to go about. Uh, First of all, I mean, I, I think that stands out more than anything else is bootstrapping is holistic and not a sort of reductionist approach. Uh, it calls for some openness and a total different attitude towards sharing that almost needs a transformation of our culture for it to thrive. Uh, and it needs to be internalized. I mean, Doug sort of complaints as uh, uh, sometimes, I mean, when companies come in and ask, what can you do for us? And he said, I mean, you, you have to be doing this for yourself. I mean, I sort of draw a parallel with this on the uh, quality movement. Uh, I mean, the, the Japanese were extremely successful. I mean, see how they take quality. I was watching CNN when they talked about the, 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 the uh, last few decades. I mean, wh when Japan was sort of going strong with their shipbuilding industry. And I mean, the, the, the factory managers will watch their ship launch with sort of their katana or whatever you call it, the, the, the knife in hand. I mean, if the ship doesn't launch, they kill themselves. I mean, that's fairly serious about quality. I mean, we, we don't do it that seriously. <laughs> or alternatively, I mean, when you internalize, I mean, I mean sometimes my kid would say, he's busy or he's sleepy or tired or something, then, then I would usually say, I mean, I can't learn this for you or I can't take a nap for you. I mean, that's something that they'll have to do it themselves. Uh, same thing with bootstrapping. It needs to be internalized. And at this point, uh, bootstrapping is still sort of in Donald Stokes' term uh, in his Pasteur's Quadrant. I mean, th this is a book uh, which sort of critiques on the way Vannevar Bush has sort of isolated sort of uh, the research agenda into two poles of a basic research and, a t uh, and an applied research. Uh, Doug's idea is a sort of use-inspired basic research. And again, it doesn't fall into anybody's lap. Uh, and lastly, it calls for action and not talk. So not, not just talk. Not just talk. <laughs> we talked it. So with this, uh, I'll end the session. And I was told that uh, it's time for a break too. Thank you. <laughs>